This is Paul Schmid. Welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Cycling 4,700 miles across the USA was the easy part of Rob Greenfield's 19-state adventure. So what was the hard part? How about doing it using electricity only from renewable energy, consuming water only from natural sources, and eating only locally grown organic food? A challenging, off-the-grid adventure. The ride was done to inspire Americans to live a healthier and happier lifestyle for themselves and for the planet. And you can learn more about it at greenfieldadventures.org. Rob Greenfield, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Thanks for having me, Paul. It's great to be here. Rob, how did you get the idea for this adventure? Well, it's uh, it wasn't something that just happened all at once. I actually, I'm an adventurer by trade. It's what I do. About six months out of the year, I'm off uh, running around the country or the world doing creative things that get people thinking and get people acting. So um, I was actually out in Hawaii for a month on another adventure in February of this year and I was just trying to I was just brainstorming ways to to get people to start thinking about using resources in a more conscious manner and uh, doing it in an entertaining way and biking across the country was something I always wanted to do so I combined the two efforts into one big adventure Before you started this off the grid adventure you had to come up with some rules for yourself what were the rules well, there's, uh, there were six rules that I came up with, and I kind of turned them into five. So the first one is that I could only use water from, or the first one is only electricity that I created myself via alternative energy devices. So that would have been solar power for the most part. And then I also used what's called the power pot, which is a pot that uses the temperature differences to charge USB powered devices such as my iPhone. So basically you boil some eggs and you can charge your iPhone at the same time. Um, And then my solar panels were uh, to charge my laptop and my cell phone. So that's the first rule. Second rule was water. All of my water had to come from local sources such as lakes, rivers, streams, wells, or rain. And then the exception was I could drink water that was going to waste from leaky faucets or water bottles on the side of the road or any creative means I could find that. Thirdly, I was eating all local organic food and unpackaged food. Fourth was that I was, uh, the goal was to create almost zero trash. And then what, what trash I did create, I had to carry all the way across the country with me and also composted all my food waste. And then the other rule was to shop at businesses that have an interest in creating a better planet. So basically businesses that practice corporate social responsibility. Now, did you have to bend those rules at all or modify them as you went along on the adventure? Yes. So when I went into this, it said on my website, it said, that I was going to do it completely off the grid. So my goal when I did this, when I started, was to literally cross the country without creating a single piece of trash, without using a single drop of water from on the grid, without eating a single food in packaging that wasn't locally grown. And so I was I was planning on doing it 100%. And I did find that I had to bend the rules at times, um, And so I used, for electricity, five times I plugged into outlets across the country to use my laptop for blogging and writing, but I managed to not turn on a light switch for the entire time. And uh, I created two pounds of trash, which the average American creates about four and a half pounds a day, and I created two in 104 days, so pretty minimal. And then um, water, I turned on two faucets for the entire trip. So, yeah, there were a couple times I bent the rules, but um, and that occasionally I did get myself some ice cream. <laughs> but for the most part, I stuck pretty rigorously to them, and uh, uh, it was a challenge. But I and I will say I could have done a little bit better, but I'm happy with I'm happy with the statistics that I came up with. Tell me about your bicycle. 
<laughs> it's uh it's a bamboo bike it's handmade in ghana africa and it's made out of bamboo so the frame and the frame is made out of bamboo ficus bark and plant-based epoxy handmade in africa and then sent over here craig kelfie is the is the guy in charge and he was the he's actually one of the the best known bike builders around he was the first guy to use carbon fiber in a bike and uh one of the first with bamboo so 4,700 miles on a bamboo bike and i had no problems it is a, a very well put together machine and i'm amazed at <laughs> i'm amazed how well bamboo works the website for the bike is bamboocero.com where you can learn about how they're made and the money being put back into the economy in africa and it's still holding up well after all the way across the U.S. Totally. I have had just a few problems. I had eight flat tires. I had to replace one actual tire. A couple of times I had some issues with the derailleur. But I think in total I spent $200 over that 4,700 miles on maintaining and repairing it. And none of it was problems with the actual bamboo frame. Now you also had a trailer. Tell me about your because I know you started with one type of trailer, then you had issues, and you switched to a different type. Yep. So I started with a big two-wheeled trailer that was something I got online for about a hundred bucks. It was not quality, but I liked it. I liked the setup that I had. I had uh, solar panels mounted to it, and I had them set up so that they could be changed direction to to have the best angle for the sun. So what happened was. The trailer didn't work out too well, and I made it four miles from my starting destination on April 20th, broke down, and had to replan the whole thing. <laughs> uh, spent the whole next day uh, figuring things out. I, I mean, I was, I was pretty distraught, I'll say that. I, I was all right, but I was, I was pretty distraught. So the next day, I got a Bob trailer, B-O-B, and that's pretty much one of the best trailers that exists for bicycle touring i mean at 40 that would have been 4696 miles on that and it had zero problems besides two or three flat tires but anyway the trailer is uh covered in solar panels 37 watts of solar panels I would normally not travel with a big trailer because I'm a minimalist, but with this trip having to be completely self-sustaining and have things to purify my water, generate my own electricity, carry food when I find it, and large amounts of water, it just only made sense to have a trailer. I'm curious because a lot of times, every time you seem to go in and you reach a new town, the first place you go to seems to be the trash of a supermarket. (laughs) <laughs> I guess you've read a lot of my blogs. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm really, I mean, I was just astounded at what you found in those in those trash bins. Tell me about that. Well, I was astounded too, Paul. I mean, I am 26 years old. I have never dumpster dived before this trip, which began just a little over three and a half months ago and never really had any intentions of it. But the rule on this trip was local, organic, unpackaged food. And if I couldn't find that, then food that would have gone to waste because the idea was to have as minimal environmental impact as possible. And food from a trash, well, there's no negative environmental impact. In fact, it's a positive impact because uh, I'm taking resources that would have gone to the dumpster or would have gone to the landfill. And instead, I'm uh, making use of them and actually degrading them, biodegrading them. So so that's the, the reason behind it. And then what I found was that we just waste an incredible amount of food in this country. It started out with local grocery store dumpsters that I'd go to and I'd find fruit and vegetables and bread. And sometimes I even found still frozen things of ice cream. <laughs> and And it just... And then it got to the point where I started to, a lot of times, not even look for the local organic food because I could go get healthy, good quality, fresh food right at the grocery store that was going to go to waste and and eat it. And on top of that, besides it being, in my mind, something that's good for the environment, it was also free, which 
I can't complain with not having to spend money. So, but it's astounding what I found. There was dumpsters sometimes that had, say, two or three thousand pounds of food that was still good. What you find is, say, a five pound bag of oranges that has one bad orange. So you take the bad orange out and then you eat the good oranges. Um, and then same thing with a pack of blueberries or, and then bread. I mean, they throw away the bread that's a day old and it's, it's the same exact bread that people have sitting on their counters at home. It's what they have on packages is called a suggested sell by date. It's, it's not even an expiration date. It's just a suggested sell by date for freshness. And it's still fairly, I mean, it's still fresh after that. Um, so anyway, it got to the point where I could wake up in the morning and say, well, today I feel like bananas or today I want wheat bread and I could go to dumpsters and get exactly what I wanted with very minimal effort. Um, and I could go inside, I could go out back and get the same exact stuff that other people would go right inside for. So, um, I think over the trip, I ate 285 pounds of food that would have gone to waste, which is close to three pounds a day. How, are, are you carrying a scale with you? How do you know these amounts? Yeah, I do carry a scale. The reason I had a scale in the first place is because my goal was to clean up a lot of trash from the roads as I pedaled. So I brought, up, I brought a scale to weigh my trash because my company, the Greenfield Group, we, we do um, promotions online and we do things like like our page and we'll clean up a pound of trash. So, so I have trash that I need to clean up. Uh, because I've committed to it. And so this was a trip where I could do that. So I found other creative ways to use the scale as well, such as weighing the food that I ate. <laughs> Let's talk about how you held up physically. Cause I'm, you did a lot of sort of, um, interesting things while you were riding. Um, you did, you did barefoot riding for a while. You did stand up riding through Iowa. I mean, how did that affect you? Well, there was pretty much never a time where I wasn't very sore on this trip. To be honest, it was mostly my doing. I was so wrapped up in doing so many things. I mean, a lot of times I'd wake up at 6 in the morning and I'd be at it until midnight. Um, or, I'd, or I'd wake up at 8 in the morning and be at it until 2. So I was getting about 6 hours of sleep when I'd be riding 70 miles, which just was not enough time to rest my legs or my body. So I was sore all the time, but I was okay. Uh, It was, you know, the whole point of this trip was to make as much usage of my time as possible and do as many things to raise awareness as I could. Um, So I was having fun doing it as well. But with a negative attitude, undoubtedly, I would have been a wreck physically. But since I was very happy and had a very positive attitude, my body could, my body could tell. And if there's a mind-body connection that I've realized. And if, if you're sending good vibrations throughout your body, your, your muscles, it makes a difference in, in your muscles. So, yeah, I mean, I was very sore, but uh, overall went really well. I left for San Francisco weighing 150 pounds. In Nebraska, I weighed myself. I was at 152. And then somewhere around Ohio, I weighed myself and I was at 155. And then just mo- just this morning, I stepped on the scale, which would be five days after the trip ended. And now I'm at 160. So I've actually just been gaining weight the entire time. Right. Muscle. I guess muscle. Yeah. I'm, I was curious um, whether you use sunscreen on the trip. Very little. A friend of mine gave me some to start the trip. Uh, It was some some good stuff that's not full of chemicals, not that standard stuff that's just like got 30, 40 ingredients. So she gave me that and I used that very rigorously on my nose and my cheeks. My hair grew out, so which covered my ears, so I didn't have to use it on there. But besides that, occasionally some on my shoulders, but not a whole lot of sunscreen. It's one of the bad habits that I have is is not wearing sunscreen. And it's just that I I like to do things as naturally as possible and applying that is, is not natural in my mind. But 
I definitely understand the risks of skin cancer. So it's one of those one of those things that I haven't exactly figured out what I want to do yet. So let's talk about some of the ride. Uh, what was some of the like? What was the toughest state to ride through? The toughest state would be northern Kansas. Um, everybody says Kansas is flat, and so I came out of the Rocky Mountains expecting the Great Plains to be flat and easy riding and life to be good. It had just been maybe a month of riding first over the Sierra Nevadas and then over the the Rocky Mountains and I was just so excited for wide open spaces and, and big days of riding and the first day out of Denver uh, I did 102 miles and it went really well and then the next day the wind picked up from the southeast and so sometimes it was a headwind, sometimes it was a sidewind, but it was 30 miles per hour almost constantly. There was no gusts. It was just a constant 35 mile per hour wind. And it went on like that for about five days. And then on top of that, Kansas just was not flat in any way. It was it was up and down and up and down. And it was up with big winds in your face. So it had those two things working at once. And one night I I finally got over exhausted from staying up too late and just exerting myself and I ended up I ended up taxing my system too much and I spent the entire night puking. I couldn't even hold down water and and that made for a rough couple of days of recovery on the bike because I was just beyond dehydrated for about 2 days after that. So Kansas, Kansas was the hardest. Any other um, sections of the route that that are worth mentioning? Well, the Sierra Nevadas were great. I left San Francisco with almost no training whatsoever. I was, for me, out of shape. I had injured my uh, foot. I cut it open on a shell uh, in San Diego, and I it was it was really deep. The fat tissues were hanging out. And uh, I didn't want to go get stitches, so I just glued it shut with super glue. And the recovery process was pretty long, and that put me out of shape quite a bit. I think it was four to six weeks of kind of having to take it easy. And uh, then after that, I was spent. I spent a month planning the trip, and that meant me sitting on the couch mostly. So anyway, when I left, uh, I was pretty out of shape, and the Sierra Nevada mountains start just two days after you leave San Francisco. So I was a bit worried, but about a day into the climb, I started to actually be able to take notes with pen and paper as I was riding up the mountain. And when I realized I could do that, I realized I could probably make it the rest of the way without any serious issues. So that was when I when I came to the realization that things were going to be all right. And then the Rocky Mountains were beautiful. It was just great to get back up into nature there. It was there was a lot of snow on the ground, maybe three, four feet, and it was cold. And then before that was the the Nevada Highway fifty, which is the loneliest road in America, five hundred and fifty miles of almost nothing, and it got down to eighteen degrees at night and I had a sleeping bag that was rated for forty degrees. So I was pretty darn cold, to say the least. And then uh, life got good once I hit basically Wisconsin. It was summertime, it was hot, it was humid, and I could sleep outside at night and be comfortable. And from there, it was it was good. And then um, I got to the big city of New York, and, and from there, it was the East Coast. And that was a couple weeks of being in the big cities, which was a whole new, a whole new thing. It, the whole trip was just ever changing. Every day was a new scene. I read a lot of these cycling blogs and people always mention how cars drive by and somebody will throw something out of the car at them. <laughs> Did that happen to you? I never had anybody throw anything at me. No. That's good. But uh, my cameraman told me one time about a guy who threw a battery at him <laughs> and it hurt quite a bit apparently. <laughs> So I had a fair share of people that just were not nice and just completely uncalled for. I, I had semis 
in the opposite lane of me that would as when they're right as they're about to go past you they blast their horn as loud as they possibly can and like almost it just it almost blows you off the road and that that happened a couple of times which yeah i guess they're just really really bored and have nothing else to do but it doesn't make sense to me to do something that mean to somebody uh for no reason no good reason so but no i had great experiences with with biking across the country it, it was mostly all great now you mentioned uh, your cameraman so the whole time this is going on well not the whole time but a big chunk of the time that this is going on you have another person there riding with you whose name is Brent yep and so and you guys don't always get along throughout this journey so tell me a little bit about that story yeah, we did not always get along, and it'd be interesting to go back and read my blogs and and see how often we did or did not, because it's hard to remember. But we started out together, and uh, we made it all the way until Boston, which was about ninety days in. And by then, uh, we decided that it was just too hard to always be together all the time, and so and so we parted ways there. But it was a great experience riding with him. Uh, we're both, we are both the kind that tend to do things on our own a bit more independent. He biked across America last summer on his own. And, uh, it was just a challenge because I'm used to kind of getting up and doing what I do. And I'm a big planner long term, but on my 24 hour schedule, I'm not a planner. I wake up and I know what my objectives for the day are and I'll conquer them throughout the day, but I don't know exactly when. And so it was challenging because having to plan with somebody and, and accommodate each other. And it was actually one of the hardest parts of the trip, actually having another human to, to, that relies on you and that you rely on for things. And, but it was definitely good to have him, and uh, I, I wouldn't have had it any other way. Now, how did he get connected with the project? Well, that's a, a funny story. I'll shorten it up. But basically, he biked across America last summer from Florida to San Diego. And he was following a blog uh, by this guy named Nishant Prasad. And he is a man who's bicycled, bicycled across the country multiple times. And I met him at a Trader Joe's. He was just an interesting looking guy. And I started to follow his blog. Well, Nishant and Brent had never met, but Nishant told him to look me up in San Diego. And then uh, Brent ended up staying, uh, camping in my yard by the beach for three or four months last summer. And then um, he's big into photography and biking. So I invited him to, or I asked him to come with me this summer to document the trip. Along the way, you visited some organic farms. Tell me about uh, one of those experiences. Well, the best experience was in Ohio. It was uh, the Stollers, Scott and Charlene, and they had eight kids, six of which were still living on the farm. Two of them were older and married. And it was just the, – the incredible thing about it is that these farmers, they produced – 80% 80 of the food that was on their kitchen table every day was food that they grew right there on the farm. So they had their own vegetables, they had their own fruits, they had multiple fruit trees, grapes, different berries, I think over 20 or 30 types of vegetables they grew. And then they had, uh, they jarred and canned a ton of stuff. Their pantry was just loaded. They did honey, they did maple syrup. Uh, they also, it was a dairy farm, so they did all their own yogurt and milk. They made their own ice cream. They made their own bread and cakes. And it was just, <laughs> for me, it was after a long, long time of riding and having to search for food, staying there for four days and being able to eat almost everything there was just an incredible experience. You did a lot of warm showers. You did some couch surfing. Overall, how do people react to um, what it is that you're doing on this trip and the rules that you set for yourself? 
actually people react really well people understand understood on this trip that i was on a mission and that i had objectives and intentions so surprisingly not a whole lot of people thought that what i was doing was that crazy i don't think even though a lot of things i was doing were you know not stuff you would normally see and not and especially a lot of it's not things that bikers would normally do. Like most any biker, when they get to a host's house, one of the first things they're going to do is take a shower. And I didn't take a shower for this entire trip uh, to conserve water. I bathed in lakes and streams and I mean, and I was extremely clean. So hygiene was not an issue, but so I was doing things very differently and I used the warmshowers.org website for hosts and and so it was, you know, unique that I, there were so many things that I wouldn't do. Also, I couldn't use electricity, which means that people couldn't cook for me. And most, a lot of people don't eat local organic food, which meant that I couldn't eat most of the food in their homes. So really, all I could do was sleep. And since I wasn't using water from on the grid, I also had to be careful that I wouldn't use sheets that they had to wash because that would have used water. So... Uh, it was a interesting experience with me being so conscious about every little detail in homes where they might not think of those those issues. So, but I will say everybody was ex- almost everybody was extremely accommodating. It was there were some people that that just loved to <laughs> some people that just loved to accommodate, and I couldn't I couldn't let them. All I could do is sleep and and be there and and have fun with them. So. That was a challenge, but overall, people were excited, and and I know a lot of houses that I left, when I walked out of there, the people inside, they were thinking about conserving resources, and a lot of them, a lot of people told me that, that afterwards that they couldn't look at things the same, they they couldn't leave a light on, when it wasn't being used or waste water, and and so, it worked. <laughs> Earlier, you mentioned simplicity. Can you talk a bit about how that plays a role in your life? Yeah. Basically, what I've found is that if you live simple, you will live free. And it, in so many ways, it applies to life. I mean, basically, what I've found is the more stuff that you have, the more time you need to manage the stuff, the more money you need. For example, if you have a car, it doesn't it doesn't come down to just having a car you have insurance you have registration you have maintenance uh, and then of course you probably have some park it, parking tickets and and then problems with it and things like that or or with a house you've got if you have a yard that you have to mow all the time and then just all sorts of maintenance and then but it comes down to simple things too just having way too much stuff that you don't need the more stuff you have, it just it ends up taking your time and your energy. And so I've found that the less you have, usually the happier you are. There's a shirt sure, there's a certain threshold. You need to have your basics like food and water and enough money to to get those things and education. But once you get to a certain point, it doesn't make you any happier to have more stuff or more money, it usually ends up detracting from life. So what I found is that by appreciating the small things in life, whether it be the healthy food that you're eating, the rain, the sun, the trees, the road that you're riding on, just paying attention to these small details in life is what truly makes me happy. And so it's the simple things in life that make true happiness once you realize that. And the beautiful thing about that is those simple things are everywhere and they're free for everyone to use. Public parks, for example, or or the library, reading books. These are things that everybody has access to here in America, mostly. And a lot of people all over the world do. And um, by appreciating the simple things in life, it just makes it very, very easy to be happy. Rob, did you learn anything new about the United States on your trip? I would say one great thing I saw is just how 
and you know how nice Americans are. We we really and I've seen this in other trips. I've I've been all over the country. Um, I've been to forty eight states so far, and and it's just amazing how great of a country we live in. I mean, yeah, we do have our issues, and we have a serious load of issues, but. Overall, I mean, we live in America. In many ways, it is truly the land of the free. We have the most beautiful national parks, and we have so much diversity. The West Coast versus the East Coast, the North versus the South, the metropolitan cities versus the the giant national parks. We have so much offered here for us, and there's so much beauty. There's so much diversity, and it really is just a magnificent place. We're all so lucky to live here. And again, I know we've got a lot of problems with, with government and money and, and all sorts of things like that. But anybody born in the United States is truly fortunate to, to get that opportunity to be born here. What new things did you learn about yourself on this trip? Hmm. What new things did I learn about myself? Or was there one, maybe one new thing? Well, when you think something's crazy and you think you're not going to be able to do it, try anyway, because a lot of the times you will be able to do it. There's just all, all these things that it's like all these times I'll try, I'll think, I'll think about something and, and it just seems like there's no way I can do that. And I'll try it and then boom, I do it. Uh, A small example is I figured out how to do a headstand and pick up my bike with my feet and, and then hold my, hold the bike on my feet while doing a headstand. And it was just one of those things I never thought I'd be able to do, but I tried it and I could do it. And so bottom line is I, I just always, always managed to exceed my expectations and and the, the great thing is, is the human body and the human mind is just an incredible, incredible thing. And we underestimate it all the time. We, under, we all underestimate what we can do. Even I still do. But it's so much of, of everything. Is, it's all attitude and it's all mental. And if we, if we think about things in the right way and in a positive manner, so often we can do things that we never thought we could. Rob, what's next for you? Well, uh, right now I'm in Vermont. I'm taking a 55-mile ride down into New York tomorrow and then staying at a lake for a couple of days to relax. Right now I'm spending a lot of time on the computer, catching up on things, writing. I'm writing this book about the journey, uh, the, the documentary. I have to put that together as well. So those are a couple of big projects. And then I came up with about 10 big adventures on this trip that I'm hoping to do all of them within the next year. Most of them are creative ways to bring awareness to uh, environmental issues and just like I've been doing, inspire people to start using resources more wisely and in general start living a happier, healthier lifestyle. So my my day-to-day basis is just to wake up and inspire as many people as I possibly can to start being happier and start living a life that's better than better for themselves, their community and for the earth. And how do people contact you? Uh, well, my website is greenfieldadventures.org. You can follow me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Rob J. Greenfield, or you can email me at Rob J. Greenfield at gmail.com. And, uh, on my blog, on my website, which again is greenfieldadventures.org, I do a daily or every other day blog about my adventures, what I've learned from them, a lot to do with just generally living simply, living happy, and then uh, same on my Facebook page, a lot of posts about just living a, living a good life, doing good things and that are good for yourself and good for everybody around you. Rob Greenfield, thank you for talking to me today. I really appreciate it, and it was a great story, great adventure. I enjoyed reading it, and good luck to you. Okay, well, thanks so much for having me, Paul, and thanks for letting me tell my story. You're welcome. Recorded August 6, 2013. For more great podcasts, visit thepursuitzone.com.